Thanks for checking out this movie review video. This is for the 2004 film, actually straight to video film, Tremors 4, The Legend Begins. Uh, now this one actually had a smaller budget than Tremors 3, which had $6 million. This had $5 million, and it was done three years later, so it's kind of like it was more than a million dollar decrease in a sense. Now I know you may be saying to yourself, wow, you're really committing um, doing all these Tremors films, and yes, I'm going all the way. Uh, this is number four, I will be watching five and six, and apparently we're getting a number seven in October, so let's find out how that goes. I'm going all the way with this. So, this one, Tremors 4, was directed by S.S. Wilson, who also directed Tremors 2 Aftershocks, which is a good one. That one's pretty fun. I feel like this film, Tremors 4, is where you really see a, a another step down. It's starting to get not so hot. Uh, Tremors 3 had some problems, a decent amount of problems, but it was also still pretty entertaining and a good time. This is the first one where there were larger stretches of film where I felt like I'm not really enjoying myself at all. Can we hurry this up? So yeah, but I'll talk about that a little bit more. So directed by S.S. Wilson, who was also involved in writing the scripts very early on. Uh, written by Wilson himself, Brent Maddock, who is also a, one of the writers, those two work together. Nancy Roberts, who also wrote scripts for Tremors 3 and the Tremors TV show. And Scott Buck, who wrote episodes for a bunch of TV shows, including The Inhumans, Rome, which was on HBO, which was a fantastic show, Dexter, which was also a fantastic show on Showtime, and Iron Fist, which was complete garbage on Netflix. So, a mixed bag. Michael Gross returns as Burt Gummer, and we get Billy Drago in this. I'm a fan of Billy Drago. He hasn't been in a ton of stuff I've seen, but I like the way he acts. He always has interesting, like, creepy, weird, evil-looking characters, and he's like that in this. But you can tell he actually has fun with the role uh, in this one as a Black Hand Kelly, the hired gun, which I think he might be my favorite part of the movie other than Michael Gross as Hiram Gummer, Burt Gummer's grandfather, I think. Yeah, it's... um. Yeah, those are the two best parts of it. Billy Gummer, or I'm sorry, Billy Drago and Michael Gross. Uh, Billy Drago's been thing, in things such as Pale Rider, Vamp, The Untouchables, Children of the Corn Genesis, and my favorite role of his, Imprint. The Masters of Horror episode by Takashi Miike, Imprint. Really good. If you haven't seen it, watch it. Like I said, this was direct-to-video and the budget was $5 million, so pretty low budget there. Uh, and it looks like it. I mean, when I was watching it, I was thinking to myself, the production value of this and the way it's playing out <laughs> seems like a made-for-TV episode of the show Hercules uh, starring Kevin Sorbo. Uh, that's what it reminded me of, because I remember catching that show every now and then when I was much younger on TV. This was a PG-13 film. Uh, I think it was the third one that was PG, but this one's back to PG-13. Uh, it came out to mixed reviews with people citing aspects as better than Tremors 3 and other aspects as worse than Tremors 3. I would just say overall worse than Tremors 3 because I can't find anything that was better than Tremors 3 because you have Michael Gross in 3 and 4, so what would be better? Well, I guess they liked Billy Drago. I don't know, maybe I like his addition, but he doesn't stick around long enough. I would have liked him to be there throughout the entire film instead of getting eaten by a graboid, although that is a good scene where he basically gets swallowed whole by a graboid. That is a good scene, especially he's like shooting his pistol downward while he's getting eaten. I like that. He went out in a good way. This is a really interesting little tidbit of knowledge for this. There was a browser-based video game that was released during when this film was released called Dirt Dragons, where you hunt graboids. Apparently, you can still find it if you really search the internet. Um... I need to look for that. And and it's called Dirt Dragons because obviously in this film, instead of calling them Graboids, they call them Dirt Dragons. Graboids wasn't actually a name until the first movie, which was taking place in the 90s, late 80s or early 90s. Uh, in this film, they definitely captured the 1800s feel with the costuming and starting things out by showing people working very hard, doing backbreaking labor in these mines. Uh, obviously, the mines are one of the big focuses of this, although not a lot takes place in the mines other than the kind of opening shots. 
but the mines are the most important thing because they are the life source for the town of rejection, which obviously becomes perfection in the end of it and will lead us to what we know as the first Tremors film, basically. Um, at this point, you only need the noise of a graboid getting someone to really know that's what's going on. I think they were heavily relying on that, especially early on in the film. It seemed like um, they didn't want to show you the graboids too early on, but making the noises, you know, people who've seen plenty of the films are just like, ah, that person just got nailed by a graboid. And it wasn't a bad thing. Like, you want to see them, but at the same time, especially early, super early on, you're like, okay, I get it. But they didn't go too long before they actually started showing the graboids, but they started showing like the littler versions of them. And I liked the aspect of the fact that they could kind of like fly through the air real quick. That was kind of fun. Although not a lot of the kill scenes or deaths were all that good. The only good deaths and kill scenes came at the very end of the film where it was them killing the graboids, um, which I think there was, there was a total of like four big graboids throughout the film. Um, but yeah, the, those are the most satisfying, like the big graboid kills at the end, because when you get the splatter of that orange, the orange graboid guts going everywhere, very satisfying when that happens. But the fact that we had so few of those moments and you had to wait so long for it really kind of sucked. Um, the other thing that actually kind of sucked about this is I really think they should have cut down the first hour of the film heavily. I mean, it's an hour and 40 minute film and for the low quality of it and, and being direct to video and low budget, they really should have saved some of that money and put it towards, you know, maybe more graboid kills or better looking graboid kills or better looking people kills. Uh, because an hour and 40 minutes is not the runtime you need for Tremors 4 when it's going direct to video. I, I mean, the runtime on that should be maximum an hour and a half, but for what story was there and what was going on, I would argue maybe an hour and 20 minutes really would be more appropriate. They really should have cut down the first hour because the first hour drags pretty bad. There's not a whole lot of fun or interesting stuff happening. The last 40 minutes, actually, it is, is decent, you know, kind of good. There's stuff to enjoy there. It's more engaging. So, you know. Chance Market was there in the beginning. I like that aspect of, of showing that. And, and there are like some good nods to uh, the fans of previous uh, Tremors films. So that's nice, like showing that Chance Market was there from the very beginning. That's a cool, nice thing. Um, the whole uh, playing off of the fact that Hiram Gummer was uh, Burt Gummer's grandfather, but the funny aspect of him, you know, not even owning a gun, that he which he says in it. And then um, when he does use a gun, he just uses like this little pea sh shooter, basically. And it was just like, oh, I thought you said just use whatever gun you feel comfortable with. This is what I feel comfortable with. That's kind of like a, a, a nice little joke because... You know, people knowing Burt Gummer, who's all about the biggest, best gun, which we do get later on, and you see that kind of grow in Hiram as the time goes on. Uh, it's kind of like a a uh, an evolution of Hiram to Burt, and he basically is like Burt at the very end when he has that giant punt gun, and he's doing all he can with the firearms and stuff. Oh, especially at the very, very end when he's got that, you know, rotating, the, the gigantic mounted Gatlin gun that he's just having fun with, which I think was a cool way to end the film. There's a strong point made in this about profits over lives. That's something that's very true to real life. Uh, obviously, we're going through some of that right now where people are just like, in like in this, you know, Gummer shows up and he's like, look, I need people back in those mines. Yeah, but people are dying. Yeah, but I want my money <laughs> and we need to be making money. You know, there's some of that going on with the whole COVID-19 thing. Um, pretty messed up, but... Uh, it's, it's a point in this film and it's something that does happen, obviously, and it's a whole greed over people's lives because money talks, money is everything. Although in the end, Hiram Gummer sees that it's really more about the people and it's more about this town of rejection than it is about his money. And he has a nice change of heart. He evolves as a person and he becomes a better, much better person at the end of the film because he stops focusing on himself and his riches and he starts focusing on the very nice people who opened him with op op uh, welcomed him with open arms into rejection, Nevada, which is funny to say. Oh, welcomed him with open arms into rejection. <laughs> it's just kind of funny. 
the music is bad in this. The music is very bad because it's got like this Western uh, bent to it, but it's very much like, like I was saying before, like a made for TV show like Hercules back in the 90s. Like, not good. Michael Gross does a good job with a British accent, and he's a real D bag in the beginning, and I like that most in the beginning of the film. That's fun and funny. He plays that role very well the way all the way throughout. But I think I liked him more as a D bag than the nicer guy at the end because it's just kind of funnier. Just a preference. Hiram saying he doesn't own any firearms is funny. Yeah, I already talked about that. It's funny how prissy they paint him as being early on, which actually Back in those times, uh, you know, in 2004, that was kind of a stereotype that was put into a lot of film and shows about, like, oh, the prissy British person. So that's a stereotype. You can tell they're trying to stretch the human interactions out as much as possible to try to minimize Graboid screen time in this. Yes, uh, with how much it felt like they were stretching things and how slow things were pace-wise and how much dialogue there was that really didn't need to be there, you could tell they were just trying to stretch the runtime uh, with dialogue and human interaction because that's cheap. So um, I don't know why they felt like they needed to pad the runtime, though. It's just, ugh. They really should have cut that down. They do learn things about the Graboids way too fast in this. Way too fast. Um, you know, maybe they should have focused more on that aspect of it, of them actually trying to figure things out about the Graboids instead of just being like, oh, they must only be able to hear things. Like, how they came to that so fast was insane. Very unbelievable. And there were a bunch of other things like that that they ended up learning about the Graboids. And it was like these instantaneous things. Like, they see them do one thing and they're like, oh, obviously it's this with these creatures. Obviously they're like this as well. And I was like, that's ridiculous. Uh, Hiram showing the child Fu how to ride his bike is a way of showing his softening as a character. That's actually like the first kind of nice thing that he actually does, especially after being a total jerk to Fu when he asked him if he wanted that last piece of cake if, and said, go fetch this booze for me, my aperitif, and then I will, um, you know, give you this, and then he eats it while he's gone. This is his first nice moment. This is his first moment of of showing he's connecting with the, the, the townsfolk. He's, he's letting up on being a total D-bag for a little bit, and it is a nice moment where he teaches them to, read the, to ride the bike, not read it. Oh, jeez. Hiram's monetary fate being entwined with that of the town is actually a good we're in this together premise at the beginning, which then serves to kind of bring him into the fold more and really force force him to work with these people and become a team. And then that's how, you know, you really end up forming an actual town there, which is cool. I like Billy Drago. I like Billy Drago's Black Ann Kelly. Like I said before, he should have stuck around longer. That would have been nice. I like all the Graboid tongues popping up and Hiram using a super small gun on them. That that scene in general, though, was actually pretty good. That was during the slower portion of the film, but when uh, they were trying to sleep and then all of a sudden all the, the Graboid tongues, tongues start coming up and they're shooting them, that was, that's where it marked a moment where it's like, okay, we're going we're gonna to start to get somewhere. But then it slowed, it, down, it slowed down a little bit more after that, and then it picked back up. So we got there eventually. I like the shot of the Graboid going across the chasm under the bridge when they were running away and they were like, oh, is it following us? Because it was going under the ground and they, it's like a longer shot of like a bridge over this, you know, little divide that doesn't have any water or anything in it. And you see the Graboid come out of the one side of, of the uh, earth and then fly, fly over the chasm and into the other side of earth. That looked really cool. That was the best shot of that movie. I like that. It was one thing to leave the town when the Graboids were outside of it, but when people are in danger, Hiram shows he really cares. Even gave up a lot of finan he even gave up a lot financially to go back and make a stand with the people because all of a sudden it's not about him, it's not about his money, it is about them because he feels like one of them because they welcomed him in. And that's kind of what happens. And then in the end they're going to forge this new town of perfection together. That first significant splatter of Graboid goo is extremely satisfying, and then even better is the final one exploding like a smashed pumpkin. Yeah, that final one was the most satisfying with the orange guts just flying everywhere. 
that's what I live for in the Tremors movies. Those orange guts flying. That's my favorite thing about any of these films. The changing of, of the, uh, the name of the town from rejection to perfection uh, is something that, you know, we all saw coming. But I think it's kind of a nice, nice little moment. Because then you're like, oh, this is how we get to Tremors. Yeah. Hiram gleefully playing with the Gatling gun at the end is a really nice transition to Bert for into Tremors. And it's a good way to end this film in the past. Um, yeah. And then my last thought, I can't stress it enough. With how low budget and slow it was and how little story there was there, it should have been cut down. There's no reason it should have been an hour and 40 minutes runtime. No reason. So this is our biggest step down in the series. Obviously, it's my least favorite of the series. Uh, I am hopeful, though, for the fifth one because in my pre, um, pre-viewing um, research, I was reading that it mostly got positive reviews from fans of the franchise so hopefully it's it's a rebound for them uh even though the film is 11 years after this one i guess people were really sour on this on the fourth tremors but anyway with five stars possible half stars in play i'm gonna give this a one and a half star it's not very good i wouldn't recommend it except for the really really die hard tremors fans who just feel like they're completists and they just need to see it all and like I said, you know, the first hour is not that good. So I don't know, maybe you just kind of want to fast forward through things a lot until you get to the last 40 minutes and then just watch it because then it's kind of decent. Um, but yeah. So anyway, thanks for checking this out. Real quick, do me a favor. Hit that subscribe button if you like any of the reviews that I've done, any videos on this channel. Literally, sorry, <laughs> takes you a second, but it means a lot for my channel. So I really appreciate that. Uh, that's your way to pay me back. Also, if you've already subscribed, just give me a thumbs up to let me know you're still watching. And if you want to know whenever my videos are going up or when I'm doing live streams, because I do those, uh, hit that uh, notification bell when you subscribe. But thank you everyone for checking this out. Oh, also put some comments down here. I want to know if other people have watched this film. Um, it's kind of a time suck, but you know. And look for the uh, number five, Tremors 5 review. It's coming up. But thanks for checking this out. And until next time, keep it brutal.